thanks very much. Good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I suppose first and foremost, when I was sitting there and uh, Mary said it was a GA star, Anna said to me that she has five uh, Leinster Camogie medals, so uh, <coughs> so maybe she could be a bigger GA star than me. Um, first of all, thanks very much for the invite down here to get the opportunity to talk tonight. Um, I'm going to tell a quick story before I go on to the more serious stuff, and I'm going to try and keep everybody on time. Um, and if you've heard this story before, you may have heard it before because I only have one story. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to tell it anyway, so anybody who has heard it, please pretend that you, that you haven't. Um, and it involves uh, Armagh winning the All Air in 2002. Um, Pat Spillan calls the famous Armagh one in a row team. But uh, <laughs> as, part of, as part of winning the all Ireland, you have to bring the Sam Maguire Cup around different schools and clubs. And we'd taken it around every single school and club, not only in Ulster, but in particular in Armagh, because we had a feeling that we mightn't see it again. But uh, the last school I had to take it to was my own uh, ex-primary school, St. Patrick's Primary School in Cross McLean. There was 450 kids in the room between the ages of 5 and 11. Uh, I'd answered 449 questions. It was about 1 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. The questions ranged from what was it like to score the goal? It was unbelievable. What was it like to miss the penalty? It was disappointing. What was it like to win the All-Ireland? It was all my dreams come true. Um, but as I say, it was 1 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. and I'd, an I'd answered 449 questions, but there was one little small boy at the front, and his name was Liam. And he literally had his hand up in the air for about an hour and a half. He was a persistent little bugger, but I didn't go to him deliberately because he lived up the same street as me. And even at seven years of age, he was a smart ass. Uh, so I turned to the headmaster and I said, I think that's every headmaster. He says, no, 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 what about we Liam at the front? So I said, Liam, what have you asked me? He says, Oshin, if you don't mind me asking what time you're leaving at, because we have PE at two o'clock. So, 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 so whenever I get the opportunity to speak in front of a microphone, I try to keep it as short and as sweet as possible. And I'd love to be here to shoot the breeze, and no better place to shoot the breeze about uh, football for an hour or two. But I'm here to talk about my experiences through life. And my name is Oshin McConville. I was born in 1975 in a small village in South Armagh called Cross Glen. When I was growing up, it was the midst of the troubles, the worst of the troubles in the north. And at five years of age, uh, when I went to school, I used to have to walk past the army barracks and cross. And I did that till I was 11 years of age. And then I was going to secondary school. And I thought, at least I'll not have to walk past that army barracks again. Because it scared me. The troubles really scared me, the, sh the bombings and the shootings as a young lad. But I just took it as the norm, and I moved on. And at 11 years of age, I went to secondary school in Newry. But in order to get the bus to, uh, to get to school, I had to walk past that army barracks again. I left school at 18 years of age, and I, was, I got a job working in Newry, packing boxes in a, in a factory. And my lift used to go from the square and cross my lane. And I used to walk past that army barracks in order to get to, uh, my lift to get to work. And the reason why I talk about that is that uh, it was only at 11 years of age when I went to school in Newry that I realised that not everybody had the same upbringing as I had, or as we had in that area. And as I say, the, the troubles were something that really scared me. So I threw myself into football at four years of age, and at five and six and seven and eight and nine, ten, eleven, twelve, right till I was 13. I'd say I was doing things in the football field that no young lad my age was doing. And when I say that, I mean I was in the football field every single day of the week. Didn't matter who was training, I was the wee lad who was catching the balls behind the goals and kicking them back out. And the only thing I wanted to be was the best Gaelic footballer I could be. And I was striving towards that even at 13 years of age. I was the most focused child you could imagine, especially around football. Things changed for me at 14 years of age. I walked into a bookmaker's and had my first bet on a horse. It was Grand National Day, everybody was in the bookies. It was very acceptable to walk in the front door of that bookies and walk back out again. Hands up in here who's been in the modern day bookmakers. Okay, so a good, a good number. That wasn't the bookmakers that I started to gamble in. The bookmakers that I started to gamble in was a smoke filled room at the back of a pub. And the second time I went in to have a bet, there was two people in the, in the bookies. There was two guys over. There was three people in it. 
there's two gays over here who are putting 50p or a pound in a horse, and there's a gay over here who's taking wads of money out of his pocket. At 14 years of age, I wanted to be like him. My first bet was 50p each way on a horse. That wasn't going to break the bank. My second bet was a pound on a horse, straight. No each way anymore. Then I went to a fiver, to a tenner, to 50, to 100, to 200, to 500, to 1,000, to 5,000, to 10,000. To the, the second last bet I had on a horse was 20,000 pounds. And the reason why it was 20,000 pounds, and, and honestly, the figures don't matter, but the reason why it was 20,000 pounds on a horse was because the day I became addicted at 14 years of age, I was always trying to get that big win. Just one big win. I promised myself one big win and I was out of there. I'd never gamble again. The strange thing is that 29 years of age when I had my last bet, I wasn't just gambling to win back the money. I was gambling to win back the self-respect and the self-esteem and the relationships and the friendships and the family members. All those things that I destroyed along the way. All the collateral damage to my gambling. One of the statistics they say around addiction is for every person in addiction it affects 10 other people. Well, there's 33 people in my immediate family. And I was affecting all of those. Not only was affecting those, the 45 lads that I played football with for so long at club and county level, I was affecting all of those lads. Because when I walked into that change room, I walked in there and I used football. I used and abused football. And the reason why I used and abused football was because that was the only other place that I felt comfortable. That was the only place where I could get away from things. There used to be a guy who switched on, the, uh, on and off the lights in the training field in Armagh. And he used to think I was the most diligent inter-county footballer in Ireland. Because he'd be flicking the lights on and off trying to get me off the pitch at 11 o'clock at night. I'd be just standing there kicking free kicks. And the truth of it, that was that I wasn't diligent at all. I just didn't want to get back in my car. Because I knew when I would get back into that car that all that mad madness started again. Once I picked up that phone, I felt I had to gamble. The place I felt safest was the football field. <coughs> for 70 minutes or for an hour and a half, for two hours or for whatever it was, that was when I was at my happiest. The other place I was really comfortable was the bookmakers. At 17 years of age, at 14 years of age, I probably gambled three or four times. 15 years of age, I might have gambled once a month. 16, 17 years of age, maybe twice, three times a month. 18 years of age, every single day with every single penny I had. Beg, borrow, steal, hook, scam, scheme, and all to get the money to have the bet. And when I talk about the progression of money from where I started to where I ended, the other sign of progression was the amount of time I spent in the bookmakers. So the first time I had a bet, I walked in, I wrote the docket out, gave it to the girl behind the counter, and I left, and I watched the race at home. The second time I watched the race, then I spent an hour, then it was two hours, then it was three hours, then it was ten hours. Then it was every waking minute. I went months and months and months, and I couldn't sleep. And the reason why I couldn't sleep was that there were so many people after me for money. But also... I couldn't get any rest by it. I really and truly wanted to stop gambling at 25 years of age, and I couldn't even arrest it for one day. When I talk about progression, one incident comes to, uh, comes to my mind, 1999. Ahmad won the first Ulster title, I think, in 18 years. I scored 2-7 in an Ulster final. I was getting there as far as uh, being an inter-county footballer was concerned. Um, my father was diagnosed at the same time with having terminal cancer. He was given five months to live. He spent the majority of that five months in the hospital in Newry. And I hadn't went to see my father. And the reason why I hadn't went to see my father was because I didn't have time because I was too busy gambling. But the other thing about that was that I never wanted to walk into a room where there was emotions floating around. And there was always emotions in that room. Anything concerning my father at that time and my family was very, very emotional. And I withdrew from that because I couldn't handle it. We played Meath in the All-Ireland semi-final in 1999. And uh, 
I was unsure whether I was going to play in the game or not because my father was on his last legs. And he sent word out from the hospital he wanted me to play in the game regardless of what happened. And I travelled to Dublin with my teammates and I played in the game. And directly after the game, my cousin came rushing into the change room. He said, don't get changed, just get your stuff. We're going up the road. My first reaction is my father dead. He said, no, he's hanging in there. And for the first time ever, I got into, his, I got into my cousin's car. We got a guard escort from Crow Park directly to the border, and we drove on into Newry. And for the first time ever in that car, I said hello, and I didn't say another word the whole way up the road. And the reason for that was because it was going through a mantra in my head. And the mantra was, I'm never going to gamble again. And the other mantra was, I'm going to go in there and I'm tell my father I love him. Never told him that before. And I'm going to tell my family what's been going on. So we travelled up the road and got into the hospital. And I did the same thing as I always did. I clammed up. I didn't tell my father I loved him. I didn't take that opportunity to tell him that. But not only that, I didn't tell my family what was going on. Not only that, but I didn't show any emotion. My father died on the Wednesday. That was the longest sustained period I had away from gambling in 16 years. It was those six days. He was buried on the Saturday. And when I talk about progression, and I talk about the inability to show any emotion, my father died in 1999, and I mourned his death in 2006. I went to his grave and I had the first cry. I hadn't cried for all of those 16 years. And you're probably wondering, what's this man up talking about addiction? And now he's talking about crying. And that's the biggest thing for me about addiction. That's the biggest thing that addiction took away from me, was the ability to show any emotion, was the ability to feel, was the ability to care. It wasn't the money. When I first went into treatment, my one and only time in treatment in two th October 2004. When I went into treatment, I thought the biggest issue I had was all the bills hanging over my head. I soon realised when I went in there that that was minute compared to the other problems I had. Because I couldn't share. I couldn't stand up in a meeting. I couldn't sit there in a meeting. I couldn't tell people how I felt. That was my biggest challenge. And when I talk about progression, I talk about that particular incident. And the thing about progression after my father died was another thing changed for me. The lengths I would go to in order to get the money to have the bet. Because in the end, it wasn't about winning or losing. In the end, it was just about getting that bet on. And for any of you who doesn't understand gambling as an addiction, or a concept even, um, I'll explain it the best way I can. And we see very vivid images on television of people who are strung out in drugs, in particular heroin, and they'll do anything to get that next hit. That's what I was. I would do anything to get the money to have the bet, and that was my hit. That was my hit of heroin. And I had to do that every single day of my life. And it didn't matter to me where the money came from. And the £20,000 that I had on a, on a horse was a loan which had been guaranteed by a local businessman. I went to the bother of coming up with a business plan in order for him to guarantee the loan. And I went with cash and I handed it across the counter. But remember, I wasn't trying to win just money. Imagine I was going into that book, he's looking for my self-esteem back and my self-respect and the integrity and the relationships and the friendships and the family members and all of those things. All of the people that have hurt along the way. All the collateral damage. I was trying to sort all that out with a bet. And I suppose if I can say this, that that's the one thing that, well, maybe two things, one of two things that differs from any other addiction. People who are in alcohol addiction or a drug addiction, they know in the heart of hearts, the way out of that addiction is to stop drinking. The way out of the addiction is to stop drugging. Whereas a gambler thinks, one more big bet. The only way out of my addiction is to have another bet. Regardless of where that money comes from. And the thing about, about the progression uh, of my addiction is that I would say at 14 and 15 years of age, 
when I'd only started to gamble that I was a fairly outgoing, fun-loving young lad. By the time I was 18, unless I was playing football, then the rest of the time was spent in the room. With the covers over my head or whatever it had to be. I didn't want to see anybody else. I didn't want to live in the world that they lived in. I remember taking a friend of mine gambling with me once, and I was writing out a dock, and then he told me to take it easy. And I got him in the car and I drove him to his house, and after that I never gambled with anybody again. It was always on my terms. So if I see somebody with an alcohol problem today, or somebody with alcohol on them, I'll be able to tell by the smell of their breath. I'll be able to tell them maybe by the way they stumble, by their appearance. If somebody's on drugs, I'll be able to tell by how skinny they are or how vacant they look. If somebody's gambling out there today, I probably won't know. And if you consider that a lot of people didn't know about my gambling, I kept the majority of my gambling hidden. And yet I walked into a bookmaker's with cash any time I gambled. And I would drive to a suburb in Dublin, no problem. I would drive anywhere, different bookmakers every day, strategically placed so nobody would catch on to me. Now, just have to pick up my phone, have a bet. And that's one of the biggest problems with people who are trying to get into recovery from a gambling addiction. Is that if I want to go and gamble, I'll probably have to go to a cash machine and take money out. I'll have to get myself to the bookies, I'll have to write the docket out, I'll have to walk up to the person behind the counter, and I'll have to put the bet on. Somebody recovering from an online gambling problem has to download an app and hit the button twice. And that's the society we live in now, and that's the danger. And one of the things Parents always ask me, what are the warning signs? Well, the warning signs for me were that, first and foremost, I went from being very outgoing to very, being very inward, to not socialising, to never having money, to always looking for money, to always losing my bank card, to being late for things, to never be involved in a conversation, I used to hate Christmas, hate Christmas, because I could never afford presents for anybody else. But also, Christmas was always the time I associated with emotion. Always remembering about people who had gone in the past, people who we'd lost in the past year or whatever it was. I hated being around any of that, and I couldn't handle it. So I'll finish up now, but in case anybody thinks that I'm down in Leitrim tonight to tell a sob story, I'm not. Because the truth of it is that I'm lucky. I'm one of the lucky ones. I got into recovery and, was, and I've managed to stay in recovery for almost 13 years now. And the thing about getting into recovery is that it's the start of a process. It's a continuous process. Addiction will always be the monkey on my shoulder. How do I keep it there? Well, there's two things. And I met my wife after my addiction, two years after my addiction. I want to try and explain to somebody that you're in addiction and that you're a completely different person for 16 years, it's difficult. And see the honesty, see my honesty. My honesty comes from Mary's honesty. And hopefully somebody else's honesty in here will come from my honesty because it's easier and we need to continue to lift the stigma around, the stigma around addiction. We're doing great work. We've done loads. We've so much more to do. And one of the things that I can't do is I can't be closed off. I need to keep sharing my story. Believe it or not, you people in here today are part of my recovery today. I don't have to go to a meeting today or a meeting tonight. This is my meeting. And my life resembles nothing like it was 15 years ago. I'm married, two kids. Incidentally, another kid on the way. <laughs> um, I 
I didn't expect a round of applause. It wasn't all down to me. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the thing about the thing about um, life now is that I appreciate. I always was searching for something else. I was always on the lookout for something different. When I went to school, when I went to that that grammar school at 11 years of age, I knew in my heart of hearts, or I felt that academically I wasn't good enough. And I had people to confirm that very, very quickly. And I just couldn't wait to get onto a football field or a basketball court or a running track so I could show them that I was worth something. <laughs> then I found the bookies, and I really felt I was worth something. We don't need the bookies anymore. And the thing about uh, recovery as well is that it opens up so many more doors for you. A whole new avenue to life. A whole new outlook in life. I've got two kids at home, and I will finish on this. Okay, I have two kids at home. A five-year-old who is unbelievably focused in what he does. School, brilliant reports. Only five. Brilliant reports. Loves doing his homework. Loves vegetables. Loves, <laughs> loves fruit. Won't drink anything other than water. Okay? Focused on exactly what he wants to do. Loves going to his train on a Friday evening and Sunday morning. Loves it. I have a three year old. He's not happy unless there's 14 spoons of sugar in everything that he eats. <laughs> he, uh, he's, uh, he's done a little bit of time. A little bit of time. <laughs> He's done a little bit of time in, uh, in play school, uh, in a place called Cozy Corner. And uh, I think he was in it six weeks and we'd been called in 48 times. <laughs> Not only was he terrorizing the other kids, but also uh, the staff members. But, but uh, if you can imagine that those two lads grew up in the same house, mm -hmm. under the same conditions, with hopefully the same mother and father, <laughs> uh, and they are so different. It's scary how different they are. And the approach with them has to be completely different. And everything about them is different. And everything about all those people in this room is different. It, makes, it takes different things to make us tick. And I thought it would take different things to make me tick. Something outside of what I had. I'm lucky because I appreciate what I have now. I just want to thank you again for uh, inviting me down here tonight, and uh, thanks. Okay.